Great. So I'm going to jump into it now and start off with an introduction. I think we'll be about like, I'll try to be fairly prompt through this. If people have questions, just let me know. Um, and I'll try and stop and kind of answer them hopefully fairly, uh, fairly reasonably. But what I want to do is just introduce the module a little bit and give you an understanding of what it's about. After that, I'm going to jump into the Unreal Engine for like 20 minutes and run through a couple of a couple of just basic features and kind of functionality that come along with the, the Unreal Engine so that we're familiar with how it works. Okay, so to start off, I'm going to just chat a bit about housekeeping and things. It's not it's nothing too important, but look, it's things that are useful to say, module structure, why we should study this, and then talk a bit about an introduction to the engine. As I go through this, I'm going to try and make reference to Unity a little bit. And yeah, this class is recorded, by the way. Um, so the I'm going to try and make reference to Unity a little bit. And that's where I'll say, you know, this is this type of thing here in Unreal. In Unity, we'd call this X, where there's kind of an equivalency there. OK, and sometimes that's a useful way because you're coming from a, you have a decent knowledge of Unity at this stage. You're moving into a different engine that works slightly differently, but it's just it often has different words or different ways of doing things that hopefully we're familiar with inside in Unity. So a couple of things, um, ask questions. OK, really important like that you kind of you are up front. If you're falling behind or you have any questions or things like that, let me know. When we're in the labs, this becomes a little bit easier while people are working on stuff because I can kind of walk around and I can see if someone's staring at a blank screen. It becomes pretty clear to me that that person needs a bit of help. When we're working remote, that's a little bit more tricky. So please do try and um, try and get my attention if you need to ask a question or discuss something. Take notes. You can blog, tweet, snap, Insta, whatever you'd like to do. Like show off your work if you can. Think about the way you're working. My background is in design. I think I probably mentioned this. I might have mentioned this to you before, but like I often talk about how like I think process is really important and developing your own process and starting to understand how you work and the way you create projects can be really useful. Um, you get back, yeah, what you put in, basically participate. There are people who probably won't work hard in this module and who might manage to pass it, but it is important to um, to kind of focus on trying to, if you can, and like if you're interested in this course and interested in getting a job in the industry, if you can participate and kind of push yourself to do interesting work, even if you don't want to be a level designer, it's often useful to understand some of the principles of level design and how to create interesting spaces. All deadlines are final. What that means is like, please don't submit anything late. You won't get graded for it. And my email address, uh, no, sorry, the one thing there is like sometimes people do have personal circumstances. So let me know if that's the case. And my email address is John P. Healy john.p.healy at tudoblin.e. Um, you probably know that already. If you send it to john.healy, it just goes to a different John Healy. And sometimes I don't, I end up not getting them. Um, strangely enough, students aren't too bad at this. It's like DIT or sorry, TU Dublin itself can be quite poor about uh, sending things to the wrong John Healy as well. So I often have a lot of communication that gets missed that way. So please try and be observant to that. The other way to contact me is through a DM on Discord. If you are sending me a message on Discord, like I'll try to get back to it at the next working day that I'm free. And sometimes I'll address things at like weekend or evenings, but it's not always guaranteed. OK, so like if you send me a message on Friday evening, I teach all day Monday, so it might be Tuesday or kind of late on Tuesday by the time I get around to it. So just bear in mind that there is like a, you know, I'm not I'm on Discord for like to play games and in other communities, as I'm sure many of you are. And um, just be aware that you mightn't get immediate responses to stuff. So don't you don't necessarily need to panic too much. I should get back to you. So module structure, the learning outcomes are very straightforward. Apply game design techniques uh, within a 2D, 3D game engine. In this case, Unreal functions both 2D and 3D. Iterate true concepts based on player feedback. So again, doing things like playtesting is important. Demonstrate advanced knowledge of engine functions such as physics, animation, and networking systems. We're going to look at some things. We probably won't jump into networking necessarily, but we'll definitely get a look at some of those other systems as we go through the, mo the module. Design and test player experience goals within a game engine. So you're going to like have an idea of what your player experience goals are for a level. And then you're going to test that out and see if that works. So you're going to kind of get a feel of like a slightly more test driven process. Have you used the, um, you've done play tests before. Yeah. Yeah. I remember first year you did play tests and game tools for me. Um, and you've probably done them for Baz as well. 
one of the nice things that hopefully you'll see is once we're in the new building and we're doing playtests in person, it's kind of, it's a little bit easier and it's a little bit like more casual and a, and a lot less awkward. So bear in mind that we'll be doing that as well, hopefully in person and it'll make things a bit more straightforward and a bit less, um, yeah, a bit less tricky to do. So work effectively with media content to create digital games to a consistent and professional standard. So basically you can work with different types of content. So bringing in assets and stuff like that. And I'll show you kind of those asset workflows as well in the Unreal Engine. Assessment, the assessment for the module is basically there's one thing that gets assessed at the end, but there's parts of this that will get assessed that you will submit earlier. Okay, I don't know if the, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. You might submit a level design document in about three or four weeks and you'll get feedback on that. At the end of the module, then you'll submit a level design document that will actually get graded at that point as part of the portfolio. Does that make sense? That should say playtest notes, not playtest knots. Um, but yeah, these are all things that maybe you might submit at different points and you'll have some smaller submissions. You'll get feedback at the time you submit them and then they'll actually be graded at the end of the module. So why study this? One of the big things is to use a different tool set. Um, I'm a big believer that as designers, our goal is to create experiences and that to create those experiences, we need to be able to use tools. The tools we use, I think, often aren't that important, but having experience with different tools makes it easier to try out different things. Some people really like the Unreal Engine and they like the interface and they like the way it works. Other people can't stand it and they go, oh my God, I thought Unity was difficult to use, but I really don't like Un Unreal. And it just depends. There'll be one you'll tend to have a preference for as well. Um, and yeah, understand that they're just tools and you can adapt to use a different tool to create the things you want. Some of the things Unreal is quite good at is like level design is quite strong at. First person games, it's very strong at in third person. Oftentimes creating custom gameplay can be a little bit more tricky. Not that it's impossible, it's just not as straightforward as in um, in Unity. You know the way in Unity, like the first thing we did was that mini golf game and even though it seemed tricky, it wasn't the hardest thing in the world to do. Doing that on Unreal takes a fair a fair amount more work to get it working, basically. Um, it's going to add to your portfolio. Again, there's a number of studios now. If we were doing this module five or six years ago, the module would have probably used Unity and we would have done more Unity. But right now in Dublin and worldwide, there's kind of Unity and Unreal are the two big game engines. So by and large, there's, I think there's three studios in Dublin and they tend to be the slightly larger ones using Unreal and they have a slight preference towards Unreal. And then a lot of smaller studios or mid-sized studios are using Unity. So it's just to know that it can be useful to have a bullet point on your portfolio that you've experienced with the Unreal Engine. Um, and explore love level design as a subdomain of game design. Ultimately, your degree is a degree in game design. And game design often includes things like narrative design, system design. This module kind of focuses much more so on level design. That's about creating spaces where we're going to play the game. Okay, And within the tool we're using is the, uh, the Unreal Engine. So to start off, um to start off the we're going to begin with an introduction to the unreal engine 4. so when you i'm gonna in a couple of minutes as i said i'm gonna jump into unreal and start using it but when you jump in there's a level editor and it's kind of your first point of the game engine similar to unity when you jump in you see like the scene view under things you can move around Inside the level editor, you can develop environments, you can add mes meshes, you can develop your projects. Um, Unreal Engine 5, which isn't out until next year, kind of lays some of, the some of the structures and some of the layout of things like this is a little bit better in that, but it's still pre-release software. So, But if you're comfortable, they're very, very similar. Like I think if you're, like I found being comfortable with UE4 when I opened up the UE5 beta, I, it was very comfortable to get used to. Like it was a, maybe a day and it was like, okay, this is fine to use. I understand where the differences are and you'll, you'll hopefully be the same when that happens. So the view can be switched, it can be split, um, which is the thing we might do a little bit more in this module than we would have done in Unity. In Unity, we tended to have just our 3D scene view. When we're doing, when we're really getting into level design and we're focused on like metrics driven level design, we'll often be like using orthographic views to kind of make sure we're placing things fairly precisely. 
Um, and we can move things in terms of like world space, which is in relation to the rest of the game, or like local space, like related to the object itself. And there's a little toggle at the top right hand corner of the viewport. So I don't think I can I change my cursor. Oh no. There is PowerPoint used to have a little thingy that you could bring up. Here we go. Pointer. Let's try the pen. So this here is our level editor window. Okay, this one that's highlighted in orange. Um, yeah, these Unreal Engine chairs are very popular. And we'll be messing around with those a little bit next week. But this basically is like our main view of the game. Okay, and I'm going to show when we jump in, there's different things we can do with it. But basically, it's going to show us um, a couple of things, like the name of our level is down here, Minimal Default, and it's also up here in this tab. One of the things about Unreal is like it's tab-driven, so if you, you can have like multiple levels open and multiple blueprints open, and they'll show up there as basically tabs. Um, there's things we can do here. If we hit this, it's just going to give us some options for the viewport. This lets us change between perspective and orthographic. This lets us change the lighting. So sometimes, oftentimes, especially early on in level design, we want to use an unlit mode so that we see, like, we're worried more so about placement than how well lit it is. Um, and I think this can be used to show and hide stuff. This button here. Oop. It's a problem I'm using a mouse to do this. Sorry, my hand went way too far right. Um, here we've got the different move tools. So we've move rotate and scale exact same as unity okay and we're going to use similar hotkeys to unity then we have the globe here which means that we're in um in the global the world-based movement so if we move something that's relative to the world as opposed to the local position these are our grid snaps so over here we're able to snap a number of points this is angle snap is like a 10 percent angle we'll slap, snap something for rotating this is our, I think, vertex snap within two, and this is our camera speed, okay? And that's basically our world. You'll see there's a little, like, uh, thingy down here of X, Y, and Z as well. It's similar, very similar to what we would have had inside in Unity. So then, I'll try and go fairly quick through this because it's probably easier to show a lot of the stuff when we're in the engine. Um, but the content browser is kind of a way that we get things into the level editor. So we're importing things, we're organizing things. It kind of comes from the content browser. That's where I think someone posted um, an asset pack in the chat a few months ago. Stuff like that often shows up in our content browser. Um, it lets us manage folders, stuff like that. Yeah, that's kind of main use of it. Moving, copying, viewing references. You can search for and interact with stuff. Um, Unreal Engine has a lot of different ways to do similar things, if that makes sense. Like there's three or four ways to open an asset. And I'll show you a couple of those ways. And like, look, as we, as we work through projects, you'll find a way that's more comfortable for you. So this here is the content browser tab. Okay, within the minimal default level. Um, or within this game. And you can see here, it's just basically a folder structure similar to what we would have inside in Unity, inside in our project folder. So we can think of the content browser as being similar to the, the project folder. And we can import stuff, we can save stuff, we can add, if we wanted to make a new, um, a new, let's say, blueprint, which is how we're going to do any of our scripting, we'd be able to add new and blueprint and do that there. So blueprints are, a they're node-based programming so inside in unity we wrote like c-sharp code and that's a specific type of c-sharp designed for use within unity in unreal engine we're going to be using blueprints okay which allow us like script a lot of things there's things like level bl blueprints that let us have like settings on our overall level we can have blueprints attached to actors and pawns and stuff like that and it lets the big, this is a pro and a con, and it's probably one of the things, um, an actor is like a, yeah, it's pretty much like a game object really is the way to think about it. But there's different types of actors. Um, so one type of actor is, let's say, a static mesh, which is just a thing that doesn't move. Then there's things like pawns, which are things that maybe move or animate. But, uh, or sorry, a pawn is something that's um, controlled either by the player or AI. So what they do is they let us as designers if you're not comfortable with code generally people quite like blueprints because it's oftentimes a little bit easier to figure out 
how to get something working. It's also, I suppose the big benefit of blueprints is it's harder to fuck up um, because you're dragging and dropping things into a location and there's inputs and outputs of every blueprint component. Each node, it's kind of harder to mess up and put the wrong thing into the wrong place. So here is an example of a blueprint. And what's happening here is it's grabbing a input access move up command. It's taking the access value. Okay, and it's saying if that value is greater than this value here, which is currently zero, then if that's true, okay, so that's the condition, it's going to create a jump and then it's going to get the static mesh, the character body, and it's going to replace it with like a jumping character animation. Um, I don't know, can people hear noise in the background? Okay. Uh, our backdoor neighbors, sorry, are doing a bit of work. Um, I don't think if it's if it gets annoying at any stage, let me know, and I'll try and like I'll try and do something about it. Okay, cool. That's good. At least my mic is uh, it's pretty good at filtering it out. It's pretty noisy in my headphones. Um, cool. Yeah. So this is blueprints. As I said, it's kind of nice. But one of the things is once you get complex, you might be want another thing to branch off here, and then. This maybe has another box here that feeds into something that's off over here. And I think you can probably see how this becomes like a spider web um, pretty quickly, but it is kind of nice. Yeah, it's very like, it's the same idea as shader graph or any of that sort of stuff. Cool. So then there's the material editor, which is basically, this is what shader graph is kind of based off or like the sort of paradigm that shader graph follows. So it's like you're making materials, it's node based, um, yeah, you apply them to geometry, stuff like static meshes, scale meshes, anything like that. Um, and you can use it for particle systems as well. We'll toy around with we'll toy around with this a tiny bit, but it's more so that you know how to use it, because sometimes we'll want to use custom materials, but we're not gonna go hugely in depth of creating our own like really detailed custom materials. But you can do really cool stuff with this if if you would like to. Um, and we'll play around with the particle system a little as well. But yeah, this is basically it. You have um you basically have all these nodes and they're doing different ma maps. This is your material that has the different channels. So the base color here is coming from a marble, a color marble texture. Then there's a mask applied to that. Then there's a ambient occlusion strength and it's adding that to this. And this is something you can change in the editor. Um, it's clamping these values. It's multiplying this by that and a texture sample and stuff like that, okay? It seems very complex. It's not crazy complex, but it is just a thing that like you kind of have to practice a bit to understand it. And like even for me, I don't do a ton of material stuff. When it comes time that I'm like teaching you or like looking at this stuff, I'll definitely be like like needing to Google a lot. And that's one of the things about game design. Don't be afraid to Google. It's a it's a key skill of the of the the discipline. Um so then when it comes to 3D geometry. There are kind of a few different ways we can think of creating 3D environments or 3D elements in our games. So one is geometry br brushes. These are like really basic tools. If you were using the Unreal Engine, I started using Unreal back in 2008, I want to say, which seems like a long time ago now. But at that stage, if you were creating geometry, um, you would create it with um, almost everything would be created with these brushes. Nowadays, we tend to use static meshes and stuff quite a bit. But when we're doing level design, we're going to use these a lot. And they're basically, they allow you to create um, like basic shapes. This is the idea of this is it's basically Pro Builder is based off this. It allows you to create geometry and spaces kind of pretty easily. But at the same time, it has its limits and it can get pretty pretty out of hand once your geometry gets complex so you're better off keeping things to kind of fairly straightforward shapes and having lots of them interact as opposed to trying to have one object that has lots of cutouts of it and stuff um and geometry brushes are typically used in the early stages of a project yeah so for rapid prototype levels and things unreal is more popular for 3d and I think the reason for that is it was originally, it originally would have been very hard. Like, let's say the original Unreal games, Unreal 2004, I think was the last Unreal they released. 
But those games are all like 3D first person shooters and you can still see some of that DNA of the engine still exists and is there and kind of is the, is the area that the engine kind of wants to, is most at home in. Having said that, there's a lot of 2D games made in Unreal as well. Um, and I'll try and bring up, maybe at the end of class, I'll bring up like a showcase of some of the different games made in it. Because it's not just, it is definitely more at home with 3D, but you'll see in a minute once we start, once we open the engine, it's going to want us to like say whether we want to make a 2D or 3D game and stuff like that. So it will handle either type. It's just, it's maybe 2D has certain extra complexities. So this sort of thing is made from geometry brushes and BSP. And basically all they are is this would be like a cube that's extruded all the way up to the ceiling. The floor is the same. It's like an elongated, oh my God. I apologize for my drawing skills. It's like something like that. The roof might just be a V profile or well, someone might've just modified a cube and like dragged it up that way. And then the walls are just cubes as well. Okay. So hopefully that, or sorry, rectangles. So hopefully like you can see how you can create a space that has a sense of like scale and it has a feel of what an area would be like using like if we look at this here right we've got there's these pillars which is we'll call that number one there's these walls we'll call number two roof is three uh then there's this four and five down here okay with five um pieces of geometry that's like we're able to create and confine a space that we can have great gameplay in. And we can like kind of uh, duplicate these and move them around and stuff as well. In Unreal, this is the default material, this checker box type pattern. When you're working with, um, with this is called, sorry, I always call it BSP, when you're working with geometry brushes. If you are working with a static mesh and it doesn't have a texture on it, it's like it normally has a default whitish texture. Um, but the nice thing about this is the cubes and stuff, the, the checker grid pattern, it does, it does help to give you a sense of like place and distance and scale. Now ignore these stretched dudes back here because they make it really hard to understand what's going on, but it's as a default texture, it makes it quite easy to understand the, the space and distance within the space. Um, it's just, if you stretch things certain ways, so. The reason this is stretched here is I would bet this was scaled as opposed to extruded. Basically, if you extrude, it will just pattern the texture upwards. Cool. So then static meshes is a piece of geometry that consists of a static set of polygons and it's the basis, basic class used to create world geometry. Okay. So if you're working in a studio as a level designer, the first thing you'll normally be doing is building something like this. Okay. Your first pass on a level is called like the gray box or white box, um, or block mesh. Sometimes any of those terms tend to be used kind of interchangeably. So as a level designer, your first pass is something like this. You're trying to make a space that kind of feels like, um, you know, something you can play in something that's interesting maybe. And then you're going to hand off that level. You're going to have meetings and the art team are going to be like, okay, cool. This is like, we're going to think about now what the concept for this space looks like. You know, they're going to think like, okay, this is maybe a cathedral and they're going to design up assets and stuff. And then they'll start creating things. And maybe instead of this down here being a big cube or whatever, you know, you might say, oh, that's your target for this level. And then the asset designers and the 3D artists and concept artists and everyone goes off and they create this kind of pretty um, case type thing. And then you can bring that into the scene. One of the reasons, I don't know, do any of you remember from Game Tales last year? Like, why don't we, why don't we want high fidelity assets when we're first making a game? Does anyone want to guess? Yeah, exactly. So the first thing is like time, like we wouldn't be able to get this looking well enough. And then there's like the complexity, what if things change, all of that stuff. So yeah, the first thing you want to do is make sure the level works. So basically that like the space feels good and feels like that the that the scale of things feel right. Because maybe when you play test this level, 
maybe this is supposed to be like a farmhouse or something and you've just completely got the scale wrong. If you've put in assets here, it's much harder work with changing out those assets than it is to change this initial geometry. The other reason is like, have any of you ever, um, I don't know, I love stuff like grand designs and things. Uh, well, I, used to, I haven't watched it in years, but um, have you ever watched shows that have like architects on them that go through the process of maybe designing a house? Yeah, so if you've ever seen that process, um, often what happens is an architect, when they're showing the client the first, <laughs> kitchen nightmares, kind of, um, when they're showing the, the client the first concept for a house or the first idea for what the house might look like, Often they present it in one or two ways. And one will be quite like rough sketches that are just pen sketches. Um, and they're kind of quick and rough and they give a feel of um, like, you know, they give a, they're much more for a sense of like, how do you like the feel of the space? Do you like all these windows? Do you like the sense of openness? Or else they create uh, foam core models. Have you ever seen like the white sort of um, cardboard with foam in the middle that they build like little house models out of? Yeah, so that's um, that's another way to do it. And the idea is that you can lift the roof off the house then and you can look inside and you can see the layout of the rooms and kind of understand the flow. Now, a lot of work goes into creating those models and those architects probably could jump into, or like they would have people in their studios that could jump into the Unreal Engine, design out a 3D scene that looks maybe close to photorealistic in a similar amount of time. The reason not to do that is if you do that, then people become quite obsessed with the the detail. So they'll be like, oh, I don't like the color of, you know, a wall there. Or like, let's say this chest is fully sitting in the middle of the room and someone says, oh, I don't really like this detail here. And maybe we need a padlock on the chest to make it look like heftier. But you've you've lost track of the overall story you're trying to tell with the level. You kind of got lost in the detail, basically. Um, Edvin, I'll try and uh, come back to you. Will you just remind me when we get to the end of the lecture part? We'll take a look at that. Um, but yeah, basically we wanna we wanna keep things fairly loose, fairly quick to be able to change, and also so that if people are judging our level, they immediately know, oh, this isn't a finished level. Like it's not meant to look like this. This is just a rough space, and I'm going to give feedback on um, on that as well. Cool. So then there's skeletal meshes, which are basically like. 3D characters and stuff like that. It's, um, yeah, anything like that, like it's just connected bones. So this is the default Unreal character. It's this sort of like robotic guy. And uh, basically he's all these bones and anchors to these bones. And like this bone has a range of motion that maybe goes from there to there. And it allows the character kind of move his head around that bone. Okay. Um, and that's basically what a skeletal mesh is. And it has a rig you can see down here that's maybe trying to plan out where the character's walking. This is like controlling their gaze, what the character's looking at, all that sort of stuff is controlled by the rig, basically. Um, yeah, I think you can do this now. I think, yeah, there's bone animation in 2D Unity. Um, so all of that stuff is in there. And that's basically a skeleton, a skeletal mesh, basically. So you can bring this in from another engine as well. So landscapes to, if you're, there we go. I was wondering what was happening there. Um, you can create landscapes as well. You can create terrain and it allows you like create, again, like the terrain system in Unity. So you're able to like dynamically paint mountains up and down and stuff like that. So if you're doing outdoor areas or your level has elements of outside, you can, much like Unity, use a terrain system to create all these hills and bumps and kind of paint textures and paint on trees and rocks and stuff like that. Okay. Oftentimes you do certainly the painting on rocks and trees. You'll do that as a first pass and then you might go in and do more detail when you're play testing and seeing, oh wait, we want to create maybe a bit more of a path or we want to draw the player in one direction. So that's the kind of assets that we get in. Then there's the visuals. So there's a material. So a material is applied to an asset. It's like, um, the paint this is the same as materials in unity basically it's a thing that you can like wrap around something and you can do like things like roughness and shininess and all of that stuff so there's an example of some different unreal kind of materials okay so you'll see some of them will pick up light in different ways and diffuse it and they'll kind of have different 
textures on their surfaces. These are all the same sphere. It's just the way the material is applied. It changes the way the sphere feels, basically. Then there's decals. Um, so these are basically, they're not a thing we'd use all that much. They're things that you'd basically project on, like if you had um, a spray paint or something like that. And, you know, you wanted like different spray paint, maybe areas or like you wanted stuff written in blood on the walls around your level. You might apply that to a material texture on the wall um, as a decal. So you see here, like the decal just basically overlays a red cube onto this texture. OK, obviously, like this red could have writing or like a smiley face or whatever you want it to be, basically. Point lights. Again, very, we're getting into things now that are very similar to Unity. In Unity, we've point lights, okay? Basically a light bulb, it emits a, a sphere of light in an equal number of directions. Like it's kind of uniformly around the sphere. Um, it falls off basically as you get further away from it. And yeah, they have intensities and you can control shadows and stuff like that. So that there is like the point light. It's like having a light bulb or a lamp sitting right here in front of these boxes creates all these shadows and stuff like that. I'm not going to spend too long on these things because they're things we're familiar with and the difference of them is pretty small and we'll see as we start working on Unreal how they work. A spotlight emits light from a single point in a cone. Uh, basically a flashlight is always the way I think of spotlights or I suppose, well I don't know, I was going to say spotlights in a stage show are kind of like this as well so they can be kind of focused in or they can have a wider angle. Um, so here we've like a spotlight that's up here and it projects a cone of light basically down like that that would engulf that sort of shape okay and that's basically a spotlight then we have directional lights and this is for yeah they're called directional lights as well inside in unity and it's like a source that's infinitely far away this is the moon or the sun or things like that okay so Again, a directional light. This is a directional light coming in through a gap in the roof, which would be way up there somewhere, way up high. Uh, but basically it comes in from infinitely far away. The same as like the way the sun will shine in your window. It's like the rays of light are basically straight inwards and infinitely far away. Um, a skylight is a light that will capture like this and parts of your level. So what this will do is kind of capture some of the light that exists within your scene and the, the lighting and reflections in your scene will kind of match the way um the way your skybox and stuff is looking it's kind of like a nice light it's a very small effect i thought i had two images of this there um but like basically the light here is kind of capturing some of the environmental color in the game and it's kind of making it look a little bit more a little bit more natural depth of field i think we probably looked at this inside in unity with post-processing um, but depth of field basically adds a blur depending on how far away or near the camera something is. Okay, so it's this sort of effect. So you've this object here, whatever it is, is basically in focus and everything off over here is blurry and far away. Does that make sense? That's depth of field. Here there's a high depth of field. The thing that's up close is really clear. The thing that's far away is uh, blurry. Exponential height fog, it creates like this fog in like low places and less density in high places. So it gives like this nice fog effect. So it's really a, a smooth sort of fog that um, it kind of mimics. It's not quite atmospheric fog because you'll see there's a separate fog system for that. Uh, but it allows you have two kind of colors basically of your fog. So here there's like a red and a gray fog and lower down is you can see kind of here where the red and gray fog are kind of blending a little bit um, and it can create kind of like nice just atmospheric effects as well especially in indoor environments the, the exponential height fog is useful volumetric fog like kind of calculates the fog it's like a more complex form of fog it captures um, things like where light is flowing and it'll capture shadows and things like that um, yeah cool so let's so this is here, this is why this is a volumetric. So you can see there it's catching like the light rays and these rays here from the trees. That basically it's simulating a um, a density to the fog and that it's kind of catching the light basically. It's a really nice effect, it looks really well. It's a little bit like resource intensive. If you can run it, it's a nice effect to have. 
And then atmospheric fog is kind of the last type of fog we'll talk about, but it gives an approximation of light scattering through the atmosphere. So again, if you're doing an outdoor level, generally atmospheric fog is a nice thing to add in. Um, so here is the kind of thing we're getting here with like, you can see it's kind of slightly foggy and the further away you go, the light is kind of struggling to cut through all this fog and stuff. Because like really nice effect. And again, Unreal, generally I would say it's easier to make things look good in Unreal than it is in Unity. Um, but there's also a lot of things you can tweak and stuff as well. Okay, so there's a lot of like kind of room for refinement and things. The last thing I'll mention is just audio and then we'll jump into a very quick demo of the Unreal Engine. I just want to show you around the interface and make sure you know how to start up a project, but audio. So there's sound cues. These are basically um, audio sources. Um, and these are like audio files that you just play at certain points. Okay, so you can have a sound cue here and like, you know, it will decide to randomly output this sound depending on what's happening basically. So again, a lot of things on Unreal are going to look like this sort of interface of nodes and um, nodes and I can't remember what we call those again, but let's call them uh, cards. That's the wrong word, but yeah, basically we've got this node based system basically. And a lot of things are gonna have inputs and outputs. And as long as we can figure out what the right inputs are, we can figure out the outputs. And then sound mixes are like, I think we showed you in Unity last year, the, the sound mixer, but it's basically a similar thing. It allows you like mix things dynamically. Um, so you can have different sound elements and have them kind of have different priorities and delays and stuff like that. Okay. The last thing there is in sound, I'm pretty sure this is the last one, is a dialogue um, voice and wave asset. So this is for doing like subtitles and localization. Um, yeah, and you can say like, okay, if our character is a, if the person's picked like maybe an older character, then it might play this voice. If it's a younger character, they might play this voice. If they're talking to one person, they'll say you. If they're talking to multiple people, you can have the voice clip that says all of you. Do you know what I mean? So like that, basically, there's ways for it to change the dialogue depending on what it encounters, basically. And it can have different contexts and stuff. Cool. I don't know why this is still showing now. Uh, any questions on that before we jump in? Cool. I'm going to stop the recording for a second. <laughs> 